two notes all about reaction energy. And so we are going to start in class by exploring a little inquiry mini lab and looking at this. But for the sake of the notes, we're going to dive right in. Like I mentioned in concept one, some physical changes like state change involve a transfer of energy, but all chemical changes and thus chemical reactions involve a transfer of energy. And so that's what this concept is about, that reaction energy and that transfer of energy that we see in chemical reactions. Now, collision theory is, a, this should be a refresher from unit five, chemical reactions where this was first introduced. But this is the concept that reacting particles must collide in order for a chemical reaction to occur. And they can't just collide. They can't just, you know, bump into each other. They have to do so with enough force to actually change something, okay? So they can collide without actually reacting if there isn't enough energy involved. So there has to be enough energy in their collision for something to change. And the rate of a chemical reaction depends on the frequency of these collisions between particles, which we'll talk more about in concept three, which is our reaction kinetics. But for now, we're just going to focus on this energy. This is like one of the most important, these next two slides, distinctions that I can make for you in your science career, especially those of you who are biologists and are into biochemistry, like you have to understand this. Bond breaking requires energy to be absorbed. Okay, because every bond has a certain amount of bond energy, and it's the amount of energy needed to break that specific bond. Okay, so for example, two carbon atoms single bonded together has a bond energy of 347 kilojoules per mole. That's how much energy would need to be absorbed to break this single bond. Now, that number means nothing to you, so let me give you some context. A double bond between two carbon atoms has a bond energy of 614 kilojoules per mole, so it takes a lot more energy to break this bond. A triple bond between three carbon atoms would have 811 kilojoules per mole of bond energy, okay? So this is what I'm saying. It has Energy has to be absorbed to break these bonds. And the activation energy is what we say is the minimum amount of energy needed to get particles to collide with enough force to start a chemical reaction, okay? This is the energy we need. Looking at this diagram, we haven't really gone through potential energy diagrams yet. We are in just a minute. But looking at this, notice it's showing reaction progress. So as we're moving to the right, the reaction is happening. And energy, okay? So A represents our energy at the start of the reaction. What energy is in the bonds of the existing reactants in this reaction here, okay? From here, from A to C, that's our activation energy. That's how much energy needs to be input in order to break up the bonds that are existing between these hydrogen atoms and between these iodine atoms, okay? This has to be input to break those bonds. And then once we see, once those are input, we see that energy starts to be released as bonds are formed because bond making results in energy being released. So as new bonds are formed, energy is getting released and that's why we start to see this line go down. So it, the line goes up as energy is added in order to break bonds and it declines as energy is released as new bonds are formed when we make this hydrogen monoiodide, okay? So looking at the difference though between A and B, what we start with and what we end with, that's where we can identify a reaction as being endothermic or exothermic, okay? So hear me very clearly, all reactions involve both an absorption and a release of energy. And so when we're classifying a reaction as endothermic or exothermic, that's based on changes in the overall bond energy, the total bond energy, the net energy, if you will, okay? So an endothermic reaction is a reaction with a net absorption of energy because yes, energy is being absorbed and energy is being released in the reaction, but overall more energy is absorbed than is released. And we see that we get a a positive delta H in an endothermic reaction, which I'll explain what this means in just a minute. Exothermic reactions, on the other hand, have a net release of energy. Okay, so uh, energy is absorbed to break bonds. It is released as bonds are formed. And overall, we see more energy is released than absorbed. Thus, we would classify it as exothermic. 
Okay, and now let's bring back in that potential energy diagram because I really feel like looking at these diagrams helps so much with understanding the energy exchanges in a reaction. So a potential energy diagram, it's just a diagram of the changes in potential energy. Remember, the chemical, ener the chemical potential energy between bonds, that's what we're talking about here, of these atoms. And it's looking at how that changes throughout the course of a chemical reaction. Okay, so let's look at this example again. This is looking at this reaction of, um, you know, hydrogen and iodine making hydrogen monoiodide. Okay, so let's label each of the parts on this. I would label these in your notes so you can understand what this is showing you. Okay, so A is showing me, I color coded it in blue here and here. That's showing me the energy stored in the bonds of the reactants. That's the level of energy that they have within them because that's where reaction progress is at the beginning. That's what we're starting with. Okay, B, I color coded it orange, shows me energy stored in the bonds of the product. So notice the reaction progress on here. This is where we're ending, okay? Now, C to A, the difference between C to A, this hump here shows me the activation energy needed. It shows me how much energy needs to be absorbed to break the bonds here in order to eventually form new bonds. So this has to be the input of energy to get that collision theory happening, to get those reactants to collide with enough energy and force to actually change. Now, this difference here from B to A shows me the overall difference in energy of the reactants and products. Because remember, energy gets absorbed in order to break bonds, and then as new bonds are formed, energy is getting released and thus it goes down. Now, to look at the overall change in energy, we just have to look from the start to the end. That's what we see with B to A here. We look at this difference, that's our delta H, that's going to tell us if this reaction is endo or exothermic. So you're going to take the final minus the initial energy and see what you get. If it's negative, okay, that means the reaction is exothermic. You ended with less energy than you started with. It's negative. Thus, overall energy got released. More energy was released than was absorbed. If it's positive, that means that there would be more energy in the products than there was in the reactants. So energy must have overall been absorbed. It's an endothermic reaction, okay? Um, let's look at these a little bit side by side. I think that will help. So looking at these two potential energy diagrams, look at the difference. First notice they both have an activation energy. They both require an input of energy to get the reaction started. And after that input of energy happens, we notice the line starts to decrease on both as new bonds are formed, energy is getting released that this is going down. Now look at the difference in the ending and the starting. Notice in this first picture, we see we have more energy in the products than the reactants. In this one, we see we have energy, less energy in the products than the reactants. So in this first one, energy overall is getting absorbed. And so we would say this is an endothermic reaction. Whereas over here, overall energy gets released, so it's an exothermic reaction. Now, something that can change the look of these potential energy diagrams is something called a catalyst. The addition of a catalyst to a reaction will impact this energy exchange. So a catalyst is a substance that speeds up the rate of the reaction without actually being changed by the reaction, okay? It's not a reactant, it's not a product, um, but it can change the reaction by lowering the activation energy. So watch that again. Look at this picture. Boom. A catalyst would be this additional line here. I put it in yellow to match the word catalyst. Notice that we start and end with the same amount, but we need less energy to get the reaction going. That's what a catalyst does. It lowers the amount of energy needed to get those initial bonds to break. And we see, can see it on this diagram too, what that looks like. So it lowers the activation energy needed. Okay, we're going to practice um, working with these energy diagrams at, um, in just a little bit towards the end of these notes, but I want to um, introduce you to two other terms before we wrap this up, entropy and enthalpy. So the transfer of energy during a chemical reaction in a closed system, it involves changes in the energy dispersal, which is known as the entropy change, and also the heat content, which is the enthalpy change. Okay, I remember the difference because heat has a T and an H, and we see that in enthalpy, we see the heat here. And then um, entropy has the R like energy has an R. I don't know if that helps, but it helps me. Okay, so 
we see changes in the energy dispersal and heat content while assuming that the overall energy in the system is conserved. Why? Because of that first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of energy that says no energy should be lost during an energy transfer in a chemical reaction. So even though we see these changes in how energy is dispersed and the heat content, we shouldn't see an overall loss of energy, okay? Now, a second law of thermodynamics I want to introduce you to is um, says that energy tends to disperse or spread out, okay? It doesn't st tend to stay clumped up. It tends to spread out, okay? So this is why heat always spontaneously flows from higher temperature objects to lower temperature objects, okay? Why does it do that? It does that because it's spreading out, okay? So we tend to see in spontaneous reactions, an increase in entropy as we see an increase in how things spread out and we see a decrease in enthalpy as um, the heat kind of moves from higher to lower and, and goes that way, okay? But we'll talk about more about that in a second. So more on each of these terms. Entropy is represented by a capital S. It's a measure of the degree of randomness of particles in a system. System, I've said that a couple times. When we're talking about a system, we're just talking about the chemical reaction and what's going on there. And then the surroundings are just like everything else. Okay, so I like this picture because low entropy, you see the order. High entropy, you see the randomness and more of the disorder here. And entropy impacts whether a reaction will occur spontaneously. Like I said previously, nature tends to move towards increased randomness. So towards more disorder and towards a higher entropy due to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, enthalpy is represented by a capital H. It refers to energy as heat content in a system, but it isn't really practical to talk just about enthalpy because we can't directly measure that. So what we do measure is that delta H, that enthalpy change. We look at the amount of energy absorbed by a system as heat during a process at constant pressure. So if that's positive, that means energy did get absorbed and it's an endothermic reaction, it's greater than zero. We, if you were writing a thermochemical equation, like I mentioned, you'd have your reactants plus your energy um, yielding your product. If it is negative, that means it wasn't absorbed, okay? It means it was released and that's your exothermic. And so that's where we would write the thermochemical equation as the reactant yields the product plus your energy. So delta H is just, you know, your H of your products minus your H of reaction. So we're looking at energy stored in products minus energy stored in reactants. Again, if it's negative, we say the reaction is exothermic. If it's positive, we say that the reaction is endothermic. Okay, one other thing I want to introduce you to is something called Hess's Law. And this just says that the overall enthalpy change that delta H in a reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes of each part. Okay, so we're not getting into this in this unit just because this is just an intro, but or at least in my class we're not, but most reactions actually happen in multiple steps. So this is just basically saying that we can just represent the total enthalpy change by adding up all the parts um, up to make the whole. Because every compound has like a molar enthalpy of formation that represents the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of it is formed from its elements, you know, in their standard state, 298 Kelvin, 180 all that. So basically, you're just finding the sum of those. It honestly, Hess's law is really reminiscent to me of Dalton's law of partial pressures um, that we learned back in our states of matter unit. But um just thinking of it applied to enthalpies. I'm not going to personally have you do any calculations with this, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. Now, something extra I want to introduce to you honor students is this concept of Gibbs free energy. So naturally, processes move towards the least enthalpy and the greatest entropy. And when this isn't the case, the dominant factor is going to determine the direction of the reaction, um, if it's going to be driven forward or in reverse or whatever. And so Gibbs free energy, which is re represented by delta G, relates enthalpy to entropy. And it just determines the available energy of a substance that can be used in a chemical reaction. And so natural processes tend to go in the direction that's going to lower the free energy of the system. And so we can look at this to kind of determine if a reaction will occur spontaneously or not. Okay, so there's an equation that kind of 
summarizes all of this. It's delta G equals delta H, that's your enthalpy, um, minus T, which would be your temperature, and um, delta S, which would be your entropy. So I'm not going to personally, again, have you calculate this, but I do kind of want you to see the relationship between these variables. And so we're going to use a little table to summarize that. So if your delta H is negative, what does that mean? It means it's an exothermic reaction. It, let's say your delta S is positive. So it's, there's an increase here. It's making the, um, the particles are going to become more random. That would always give you a negative delta G, which is kind of remember what we're shooting for. That's like the, we're always going to move towards less energy. So if it's negative, that's a good thing. Okay, so this is what's going to result in the most spontaneous reactions. Okay, now let's look at other different combinations. Okay, let's say delta H is negative. That's exothermic. Remember, that's like, tends to be what happens more spontaneously. But let's say delta S is negative. So they become less random. You go from two reactants just to one product. Okay, that's going to be a decrease in entropy. Um, delta G would be negative if this temperature is lower. If it's higher, it's going to be positive. Okay, so depending upon temperature will determine how much free energy there is. Now, let's say it's a positive delta H. That's an endothermic reaction, which, um, you know, isn't as spontaneous as exothermic. But you do have that positive S. You get that more random situation. Maybe you're going from a decomposition reaction, from one reactant to two products. So you have that increase in randomness. You're gonna, it's going to be delta G will be negative at higher temperatures. It'll be positive at lower. So that's where you're going to, that, it'll kind of become dependent on temperature what your delta G is. And then lastly, let's say you have positive endotherm value of a delta H, which is endothermic, negative delta S, which would be less random. It's never going to be negative. This is never going to really naturally happen. So like I said, this first situation, that's our most naturally spontaneous combination. This last combination is your least naturally spontaneous combination. Like it wouldn't naturally happen because it's not going to have a, the, the, the Gibbs free energy is never going to be decreasing in this combination of things. Okay, so. Just a little add-on for you honor students, especially if you're going to go on and take AP Chemistry one day. I just want you to have seen these things at least once. Um, we're, again, my class, we're not going to calculate these, but I want you to understand the relationship between them. Okay, so now we're going to practice some energy diagram stuff.